there should be a slide coming up soon. Um, there we go. And if you look there, you'll uh, see this week's topic, Did Jesus Really Rise from the Dead? And if you knew you were coming to a church service this morning, you might already have an answer to this question. It's not a trick question, uh, but if you do have an answer, I have a follow-up question for you, which is, how do you know? How do you know? Uh, before we get to that, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, uh, well, chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. And in this letter in 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing uh, the, the church in the city of Corinth, which he seems to have founded. And this church, since he's left it, has become very disorderly. There's become a spirit of competition that's arisen. And people have been trying to outcompete each other, been making worship about themselves instead of about God. Finally, in 1 Corinthians, uh, in chapter 15, rather, uh, the Apostle Paul responds to a group of the Corinthians who have been saying, there will be no resurrection of the dead. Paul feels the need to go right back to basics, the very core truths of the Christian faith. So let's go from verse 1. Now I would inform you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. We often say in the church that this good news, this gospel that Paul is proclaiming is something we believe in by faith, and that's true, that's good, but what do we mean by faith? Sometimes I think we can fall into the trap of saying that faith is belief without evidence, without, uh, without any reason for believing. And this is the trap that I fell into when I was about 16 years old. As many here know, I was raised in a Christian home. And I believed in Christ. And I believed without evidence. But mine was a second-hand faith, uh, an inherited faith. And as I went through high school, I had to answer not only the question, what do I believe, but why do I believe it? I was confronted with a different worldview in school, a, a worldview as so many are, that said that my Christian faith was irrational, um, that I had a choice. I could choose between truth and God. And I accepted that there was no good reason to believe. I left the church and I abandoned God. Did I just lack faith? Maybe. Uh, Jesus in John chapter 20 says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. What does he do before that? Do you know the story? He is, uh, well, the apostles, the, his disciples are gathered together 
and most of them have already seen Jesus risen, but the, uh, the disciple Thomas, he, he refuses to believe. What does Jesus do in response? He proves it. Put your finger here, he says in verse 27, and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Do not be faithless, but believe. Do not be faithless. Jesus proves to Thomas that he has really risen from the dead so that Thomas will have faith. Thomas has a bad reputation. He's called Doubting Thomas. But I'm glad that Thomas doubted because it shows us that Thomas was given such convincing proof for Jesus' resurrection that he could not help believing. So why did I pick a reading from 1 Corinthians if I was going to talk about John this whole time? Well, Jesus is no longer here. He can no longer prove to us individually, uh, physically, that he is risen. So when Paul approaches this question, did Jesus really physically rise from the dead? He has to look at different evidence, and that's what I want to look at today. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians, let's investigate it, let's pick it apart, starting with verse 1. Now I would inform you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand. So this isn't new information to the Corinthians. This is something they've heard. This is something they've accepted. And yet Paul tells them he wants to inform them of it. If you have the NIV, that word inform might be remind instead. I want to remind you of the good news. And that is the ultimate effect of it. But Paul, I think, is being a little cheeky about it. He's uh, saying, you already know the gospel, but you're acting as if you don't. And so I need to inform you because it seems like you've forgotten. Uh, verse 2, the good news through which you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. So this good news, this gospel that he's proclaiming, isn't just happy news, it's not just something to cheer you up, it's the good news that saves. It is the core truth of the Christian faith. Verse 3, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I, in turn, had received. Paul's saying this isn't just something he's made up. This isn't just some flight of fantasy. No, it's an old tradition, what he's about to recite. It's an old creed that precedes Paul, that's greater than Paul. And it may be the oldest telling of the gospel that we still have, that God has preserved for us. Continuing in verse 3, Christ died for our sins. In other words, Jesus died so that we could have life. This is why Paul can say in verse 2 that, that through this gospel, through faith in Christ, we are being saved. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, so Christ's death wasn't just a mistake, it wasn't something that just happened. He wasn't just going around in Jerusalem one day and he decided or he just accidentally got himself killed. No, this was the plan all along. Centuries beforehand, in Isaiah, it's written in uh, chapter 53, verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed." Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. And he was buried, verse 4. And this is a very interesting comment. And it's interesting because Paul cares a lot. He talks a lot about the, uh, the crucifixion, the death of Christ, and Christ's resurrection. But he doesn't talk as much about the burial. So what's with that? As I mentioned, the Corinthians have been well, a group of the Corinthians, at least, have been denying the resurrection of the dead. At most, they've been saying it's a sort of spiritual or, or metaphorical resurrection, maybe. But Paul is saying, no, no. Christ was not only killed, he was buried. 
he was, uh, he was really buried. He was really killed. And some Christians still believe that, if you can believe it, that this is a, just a spiritual death that Christ went through. But Christ, uh, Paul, rather, is saying there was a corpse. It's not a, a legend. It's a physical fact. Christianity is not just about a Jesus who looked like he lived and looked like he died. It's about a Jesus who really lived and who really died and who was really, continuing in verse 4, raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. we will go on to say in verse 14, If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain and so is your faith. And that's it. That's the gospel that Paul proclaims here, that we, the church, proclaim even today, that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. But Paul doesn't stop there, does he? No, in verse 5 he continues, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is, he appeared to the apostle Peter. Uh, Then he appeared to the twelve. These are Jesus' twelve disciples, the twelve apostles, the twelve people who knew Jesus best in life, the 12 people who would be the worst people to appear to you, uh, the worst people to appear to you if you were a fake, if you were just pretending to be Jesus resurrected. If you're familiar with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you probably know that there weren't 12 of the 12 disciples at the time. Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, had committed suicide. Yet Paul says there were 12 of them. Did Paul make a mistake? Did he get his history wrong? No. The early church, uh, to the early church, the 12 is, it's almost like a business name, like a brand name. It's, It's something that refers to this group of Jesus' most dedicated followers, not just a group of 12 random people. And so when the Corinthians read the 12 in this context, they would have known who Paul was talking about. Verse 6, Then Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. 500. This is a very bold claim. Paul wants us to believe that over 500 Christians have seen Jesus alive after he was killed. Why would anyone possibly believe that? Continues, second half of verse 6, most of them are still alive, though some have died. In other words, you don't believe me about this good news, this gospel that I'm proclaiming? Well, there are almost 500 living witnesses. It's not just here are, there are 500 people who've seen Jesus alive, but most, uh, most of them are still alive, and you can ask them if you don't believe me. Then he appeared to James, verse 7. He appeared to James. This is astonishing. Paul's talking about Jesus' half-brother. And I wonder, to those who have siblings here today, if your brother or sister told you that they were the unique child of God... Would you believe them? I wouldn't. And nor did James, it seems. Neither did James, because we're told in John chapter 7, verse 5, not even Jesus' brothers believed in him. Then in Acts 1, verse 14, we're told that shortly after Jesus was killed, his brothers were among those who were praying daily, who were among the early Christians. And furthermore, James would go on to become the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and church tradition tells us that he was killed for his faith in Christ. How did James go from not believing at all to being killed for his belief? Apparently, nothing short of a miracle. Second half of verse 7, he appeared to all the apostles. And once again, Paul's highlighting it's not just random people off the street who are saying, we've seen 
Jesus resurrected, it is the people who knew him best, who would have been most able to spot a fake. Uh, Then verse 8, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul's final, maybe his most astonishing point, or maybe, maybe not. He, Paul, who had hunted down and persecuted Christians and sought their deaths, becomes one of them after he has personally witnessed the resurrected Christ. So Paul, we can see, doesn't just preach the gospel, rather he, he tries to prove the gospel. On the screen here, you see one of the possible locations of Golgotha in the background, uh, the place of the skull, the site of Jesus' crucifixion. It's not just a legend. It's not just a myth. It is a real, physical place. There probably weren't these cars around there at the time, but but Jesus' death was a real, physical death. And Paul tells us that his resurrection was a real, physical resurrection. Now, Paul's proof, as it were, is not as effective as it used to be. There are no longer 500 people around to tell us. There is no longer uh, James or or Peter or the 12 apostles. Um, So what evidence do we have? We have the 27 historical documents preserved in the New Testament. Yes, as Christians, we believe that the Bible is inspired, that it's God-breathed. But we also know that it's written by human beings to human beings in history. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 23, Paul writes to Timothy, "'No longer drink only water, but take a little wine for the sake of your stomach.'" That's a personal message. It's a message from a human being to a human being in history. And in the following letter, in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So it's not, all, it's not one or the other. Scripture is not Scripture or history. It's both. That's what I had to realize before I could return to Christ, before I could return to the church. Because once I realized that, I realized that you could assess the truth of the resurrection from a, from a historical perspective. And when I made that assessment, the evidence was too convincing. And it became more real to me than ever before. I had a choice. I could choose to accept Christ or to reject Him. I can't help but wonder if I, wouldn't have, uh, if I wouldn't have left in the first place if I had known this case that convinced me. Not everyone will be convinced by the evidence. Most people aren't. Not everyone will choose to accept the evidence even if they see what it points to. But maybe someone you know will. If... <laughs> As Peter instructs us in 1 Peter 3.15, you're ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks for you a reason for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. Are you ready to give your defense? Let's take a look at some of this historical evidence for the good news that Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians. First of all, how do we know that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures? Well, this isn't a controversial point, actually. This is a bit of an easy one, because we do have the biblical evidence, the 27 documents written from at least nine different human perspectives, and among them we have several independent accounts of Jesus' death, and and this includes the one we've looked at today in 1 Corinthians. We also have those accounts contained in the four Gospels. So we have what's called multiple attestation. We have different sources 
different historical sources pointing to the same events. And there may be differences between these sources. That might, might be a bit unsettling to us at times as Christians. But from a historical perspective, it's a very good thing. Because think about it. If you have, let's say, I don't know, we're, a, we're investigating a murder and you have two witnesses that you're interviewing or cross-examining and you ask, you ask them their testimonies and they give you the same testimony word for word. Does that mean they have a reliable testimony? No. It means that they have colluded, they have worked together to produce the most convincing possible account for their case, whether it's true or not. So when the book of Matthew tells us that Jesus' crucifixion was watched by a group of his female followers, and John's gospel tells us that he was there as well, this suggests that we're getting two different perspectives on the same events. And from our perspective, it makes it more likely that those events actually happened. As I said, the crucifixion is not a contentious point. You don't really see any major disagreements with the idea that, uh, that Christ was crucified until, really, until the, the Quran was written and the rise of Islam about 600 years later. So that's no big deal. Most people die. How do we know that Jesus was buried? Besides Paul account, uh, Paul's account in 1 Corinthians, we have the four Gospels, again, which tell us that he was uh, buried in a tomb by a man called Joseph of Arimathea. And Joseph was a member of the council of the Sanhedrin that convicted Jesus. Now, could the gospel writers have made this up? Yes, of course they could have. But would they have? We know that the early Christians held, held some hostility towards this council, this Sanhedrin, because they convicted Jesus. So it actually is very unlikely that they would have made up a story of one of its members burying Jesus. It's far more likely that the gospel writers were telling the truth. And this means that Jesus was not, was not only buried, but that Christians and Jews alike knew where he was buried, which is a significant point. Okay, Jesus was killed and buried. Now we get to the big one. How do we know that he was raised on the third day? Well, we have several facts combined uh, which point to Christ's resurrection. Firstly, on the Sunday after Jesus' death, his tomb was found empty. How do we know this? Again, we have the four Gospels which relay this information, but more than this, this is an interesting point. In the book of Matthew, uh, we're actually told about the earliest known Jewish argument against the resurrection. And this argument goes that the tomb was only empty because the disciples stole the body to fake Jesus' resurrection. Could that be true? Oh, okay. <laughs> Could that be true? We'll get there in a moment. But the point is that even non-Christians, even anti-Christians, agreed that Jesus' tomb was indeed empty. Our second fact pointing to the resurrection is that soon after Jesus' death, his disciples had experiences which they took to be appearances of the, uh, of the resurrected Jesus. The historian and uh, New Testament theologian Gary Habermas says that the vast majority of contemporary scholars in all relevant fields agree with this. This is to say that whether you're a scholar uh, who's a Christian or a skeptic, an agnostic, an atheist, you will agree that the, that the disciples had these experiences which they considered to be appearances of the risen Christ. We've already looked at Paul's list of appearances of Christ to the disciples, to Peter, to James, to the 12, to the 500. 
And this isn't something that Paul made up, remember. This is something that was passed on to him and that he is now passing on. The list of appearances here has very early roots, and it's backed up by the Gospels, which mention some of the same and some different appearances of Jesus alive after his death. Were the disciples lying? Had they, as the argument went, went, stole Jesus' body in order to fake his resurrection? No, this is our, fir- our third and final fact, that the disciples had really believed that Jesus had been raised. And this went against their worldview. It, even those Jews in the first century who believed in the resurrection did not believe in it until the end of the world. So this was completely outside of their general way of thinking. But more than this... Uh, Jesus' disciples come to believe so deeply in his, in his resurrection that they were willing to die for this fact, and they did. Acts 12 tells us that James, the son of Zebedee, who was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, was kill, killed by King Herod Agrippa, who persecuted and uh, killed Christians. Church tradition tells us that uh, the apostles Paul and Peter were killed for their faith by the emperor Nero. The disciples really believed. What is the best explanation of these three facts, given that Jesus was killed and that he was buried? Given the evidence, it's difficult to escape the historical conclusion that Jesus was raised from the dead. Of course, we've only scratched the surface. If you really want to be prepared to give your defense, there are a number of really great resources available for that purpose. Uh, a very famous one is The Case for Christ by Lee, Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel. Uh, we, there's also The Case for the Resurrection by Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona, and the book On Guard by William Lane Craig. So did Jesus really rise from the dead? Of course, you won't be surprised to hear the answer. Yes, it very much looks like he did. How do you know? The more I investigate the evidence and look into it, the more persuaded I am and the more convincing it becomes. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. And so, it seems, does the historical record. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you've got me through this. Thank you. uh, Thank you that you have revealed to us, to yourself, through your Holy Spirit and through history, through revelation. And I pray that as we go out into the world that you will make us ready to give our defenses to those who demand an accounting of the hope 